as many of you know, we've started a brand new series and the whole discussion is along the lines of lordship. And as I've said to you previously, lordship is one of the chief core values of our church. And I am so joyful, I'm so thankful to the Lord that as I joined this church, men have put this simple reality in my life, this chip, if you may, the software that says Jesus is Lord. He's not just your Savior, He is your Lord. Last week, I told you about an incident involving my residence where they turned my street, which was previously a two-way street, into a one-way street. And I started to talk about the people who were responsible for that, who were my neighbors and the people who basically run our village and our association. And what I didn't realize was they were listening to my podcast last Sunday. (laughs) And so about, uh, about, about, I think it was Monday or Tuesday, I got a text from one of the board members and saying, we're listening to you right now talk about us and and our decision about the village. Now, having said that, they're really not my enemies. They're actually members of the church. And, and that's the good news. But the point being, we have offenses, we have things that we do, but Jesus is Lord over our relationships, over the way we conduct our lives. But today we're going to look at yet another uh, part of that lordship. Before I do that, I do want to review what we talked about last week, some of the verses pertaining to his lordships, Romans chapter 10, verse 8. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I mentioned to you last week that the, the, the essence of, of salvation is intricately tied up to this idea of lordship. That it's not just something you confess with your mouth, but believe it in your heart. And when you have that, Reality in your heart that Jesus is Lord, salvation comes to us. It also says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, where we say that, it will enter the kingdom of God, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. There's a doing part to this confession. It's not just something we say, it's actually something we live by. Jesus is Lord over our lives. Philippians chapter 2 verse 9, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The idea of lordship. And I said last week, a hundred verses in the book of Acts, the word Lord is repeated over and over again versus four times only the word Savior is used. And in the New Testament, over 600 times the reference to Jesus and God as Lord. And yet we find in the entirety of the Bible, about 40 times the word Savior is used. Predominantly, the message of Scripture is God is Lord of our lives. He is boss. That's what it means when you say Jesus is Lord of our individual lives and of the universe, of the world, basically. That's what our faith declares. That's what we're supposed to believe. In which case, we've started a new series entitled, I Wish Jesus Didn't Say That. Because if he's boss, because if he's Lord, because if he's the one we're supposed to obey, then certain statements that he says are really very challenging because we don't have any recourse but to actually abide in them and obey them. The thing we're going to talk about today has to deal with a set of scriptures that are found in the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We're going to look at the one in the book of Mark, chapter 10, verse 21. You lack one thing. That's almost like saying to all of his disciples, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. That's pretty staunch. That's pretty hard. That's pretty strong. Supposed to sell everything, give it to the poor, and I will get treasures in heaven and follow you. And it's one of those deals where you just wish, I wish Jesus did not say that. And today we're going to talk about Jesus being Lord over not just our relationships, but Lord over our wealth. As you know, the Manny Pacquiao and uh, Floyd Mayweather fight is coming very soon. And if you've been following the Twitter exchange between uh, Floyd Mayweather and Manny Pacquiao, 
you're getting two different streams. And if you're from overseas, and I know that there's a lot of Americans who come to this service, not a lot, but there's some of you Americans, I can see Pete Malvicini, I can see him right there. I can see some, some people who attend this service are Americans. I, I need to understand, I'm not trying to be racist today. I'm just making a point. And this is a Twitter quote from Floyd Mayweather. But because this is an interesting quote that has to do with money and wealth and God. And this is one of the latest uh, tweets of Floyd Mayweather, and here's what he said. I'm materialistic. At least he's honest. I'm motivated by money. He's very good, but God is first in my life. There's something wrong with this statement. God will not give you anything you can't handle. That's why God gave me the best hands in the business to pray, to pray with, box with, and count money with. This is an amazing quote. Okay? This guy needs Jesus, really, really needs Jesus. Okay? And I'm not trying to make fun. I'm just... I mean, this is public. I mean, he, he tweeted this. I didn't invent this. But I need you to understand how twisted we can be. And by the way, that's fine if Floyd Mayweather said that. But if we think this way, that as Christians, we can mix up these things, we're, we've got something, something wrong. There's, this, there's a chip missing. Jesus actually said that's not possible. He said in Matthew 6, verse 24, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot, not you will not, not you should not, not you must not, you cannot serve both God and money. In other words, it just doesn't work. There's some things that when Jesus says you cannot, no matter what you do, you cannot. He's Lord. And you can try, but you cannot. In contrast, I'm reading an article from a man named David Green. And it showed up in the Forbes magazine. It's online. You can watch it. David Green is a biblical billionaire. He's literally a dollar billionaire. He's worth over $4 billion. Can you count? Four billion. That's uh, about 160 million pesos worth. Okay, his, his personal fortune, he's a very quiet man. He, he was a pastor's son. And he was raised by his father and mother to believe in Jesus, that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is king, that Jesus is supreme. And he was interviewed by Forbes because he is now the 79th richest man in America. And it's interesting because there's a different type of persuasion, a different understanding of wealth and how God plays into that. I want to read excerpts from the interview. When I ask him, this is the interviewer, to walk me through the secrets of his company's growth, which of the aerial plants represent the 70-year-old with a full head of white hair, blue eyes, and a prominent square jaw doesn't take any personal credit. Nor does he laud his executives or his 22,000 employees or his customers who will gobble up more than $3 billion worth of crafts products from him this year. If you have anything or if I have anything, it is because it's been given to us by our creator, says Green, sweeping his hand over the acres, the acres laid out before him. So I have learned to say, look, this is yours, God. It's all yours. I'm giving it to you. Powerful statement. When I read those opening lines in the article, I thought, wow. How much of this is just lip service? How much of this is just something people say, just like this man that we talked about, this rich young man? He says, he means that literally. David Green is one of America's great little-known fortunes, having turned a makeshift manufacturing operation in his living room for arts and crafts into a retail monster with 520 superstores in 42 states. Green and his family own 100% of the company, and he ranks number 79 on our list of the 400 richest Americans with an estimated net worth of $4 billion. Can that even be possible? I don't know. I always pray that. I pray, you know, how many of you know that proverb that says, Lord, don't make me too rich that I might forget you, but don't make me poor, too poor that I might curse you. How many of you have ever prayed that? <laughs> I've always prayed that. God, I, I don't want to forget you. I sometimes ask myself, how, can I, how much money can I actually handle on a personal basis as far as my character is concerned? Money has a way of gobbling you up. 
This man, for some reason, has not been, and we're going to look at more about him in a bit, but our text this morning is really in Matthew chapter 10, verse 17. And as I've said earlier, there are three versions of this story. They're, not, they're actually the same, but in reading all three, you get the breadth and width and the complete picture of what happened here. In Mark chapter 10, verse 17, Jesus was setting out on his journey, and a man, in this particular instance, the book of Mark, speaks simply of a man. The book of Matthew explains who this man is. The the book of Matthew says he was a young man and he was a rich man. How many of you know a young man who's a rich man is automatically a handsome man? (laughs) It's just automatic. I mean, if you're handsome but you're poor, there's a very strong chance you're going to get ugly. Are you here? Okay. But when you're young and you're rich, you're automatically handsome. Amen. You get what I'm saying. It's just the way it works. So this is, if this were a guy that walked into your restaurant, your church, your your company, this is the kind of guy that you want to roll out the red carpet for. He's, He's young, he's rich, he's handsome, and more than that, he ran up to Jesus. This guy was excited about God. He wasn't He wasn't just one of those flippant guys. He was even better than Nicodemus. Nicodemus went to Jesus at night for fear of the Jews. This guy was not afraid. This guy was bold about his faith. Ran up to Jesus. He was excited. He was enthusiastic. He was full of life. And then he knelt before him. Think about this. Young, rich, handsome, enthusiastic. And, he, and the Bible says in the book of Luke that this guy was a ruler, which means he was in the synagogue, which means this guy is a religious guy. Amazing. This would be the perfect son-in-law for your daughter. <laughs> and not only that, he kneels before Jesus, which means he is humble. Wow. Where do you find a character like this? This guy is from victory. (laughs) Amen? I mean, think about it. Look at what he says. Good teacher. That's like saying, honor God. Good teacher, he says. And then he asks the right question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Good question. You know how you know when somebody is thinking right or thinking wrong? Listen to their questions. There's some questions that are just not worth answering because you're answering, asking the wrong question. This guy's asking the right question. He wasn't asking, how do I make more money? How do I, where do I deposit? He's not asking that. He's asking, a good teacher, how do, I, how do I inherit eternal life? How do I get this right? Humbly coming, enthusiastically asking, genuinely wanting to know the answer. A young man, not an old man, not a guy who's about to exit. A guy who's just starting out. And Jesus begins to answer him. I like the way Jesus just goes straight to the point. Why do you call me good? Almost like, huh? I'm asking you a good question. Is it why do you call me good? No one is good except God. In other words, It's not about good. Lordship is about God. It's not about the good. It's about God. It's not about the best practices. It's not about coming to church. It's not about being a ruler. It's not about the way you manage your money. It's not about the principles. Some Christians, they have all the principles down pat. They have all the good stuff. But the point is, are you Lord? Is God ruler above you? Or is it just the good practices that you do? I remember as a young believer, one of the things that God tested in my life as far as lordship is concerned was when Joseph was a little boy and he had to go to school. And I remember the impression that God had put on my wife and I and said, I want Joseph to go to a Christian school. And I can't begin to describe to you how hard that thing was because we've come from good schools 
And we started looking for a Christian school that was near our residence. It was clear. God had said, you need to put Joseph in a Christian school. And I remember the, the hard times because the first time we entered this Christian school, it was in Broadway Centrum. It was a dilapidated uh, music, uh, a radio station. That was his school, his first school. It was a Christian school. I remember walking in there and seeing the cockroaches were as big as dinosaurs. <laughs> and I remember just thinking, I'm going to leave my son here to study here. I remember the classrooms were like little DJ booths that did not even have air conditioner or ventilation. They were like little, little fans in there. And that's where Joseph went to school. I remember the disdain of our relatives, our family, my parents, and her parents were saying, are you nuts? I mean, your kids are not going to know anybody. They're not going to meet the right people. They're not going to have the right exposure. But Jesus was and still is Lord. I remember making that decision. And, and every year that that passed, that decision would come upon us. Will we keep him there? Because every time we pick him up, it's back to that little hole. Many of you know my son Joseph. You hear him preach here. And I look back now over 20, 25 years later and watch how that word just comes out of his heart. Because at that stage, that was the only school that they would sit down that little boy and make him memorize scripture. And that word went in and in. Sometimes the little decisions that we make because we choose not to do what Jesus says, not to make him Lord over our lives and the decisions we make, the outcomes are not instantaneously here and now. They're further down the road, which is why the Holy Spirit is so important and obedience to Jesus is so necessary. I also remember the first time I came to this church. I came to this church. There were about 30, 35 people. I sat at the back like some of you at the back right now because you're afraid of the front row. I remember I was afraid because I didn't want to get called up and I wanted to make sure that if I wanted to exit, nobody would notice me. Hello. And then I learned that the church was not a place I go to on a Sunday. It was a place that I needed to come on time because Jesus was Lord and he deserved my worship and he deserved my time and he deserved my, fi my finances. I remember sitting back there and my wife saying, this is our church, this is our church. And I didn't feel comfortable because the pastor was American. And I thought to myself, he'll never really understand me because I'm, I'm a Pinoy, I'm a Filipino. But it was clear, God said, this is your church. And I'm so glad I stayed. Not once in the 28 years of being in this church did I ever comprehend what would happen to my life and where it's going to be today. And tell you the truth, my life will not be what it is, not anywhere near if not for this church. The best friends, the best relations, the most loving people, the people who have prayed for my wife and my children and I through the years can only come because of my relationships and the people in this church. That's the truth. I wish I could... Not ex I'm not exaggerating. I wish I could play it down even lower, but I can't because the truth is a lot of who I am today is because at some point, and by the way, there have been moments when I felt I wanted to leave this church because of offenses. Some of you, you got here late, didn't let you in because you had to go to Treston and you're already mad and you want to leave the church, amen? Some of you are actually like that. A little bit of offense and you walk away. Somebody needs to put the Lordship chip in your heart to know that. And by the way, I'm not saying victory is where you should be. What I'm saying is hear the Lord and go there and stay there. Make him Lord of your life. Make him boss. Make sure that when you hear that, even though you feel like leaving, stay. Stay just a little longer because he's got surprises down the road. Now, further in verse 19, you know the commandments. He says, what must I do to enter eternal life? And Jesus' response is, hey, listen, you know the commandments. Do not murder. Right? You know that. You're a synagogue ruler. 
Do not commit adultery. You know that. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Or in other words, do not lie. Honor your mother and your father. So he says, you know this. Right? You're a synagogue ruler. Basically, Jesus outlines the five commandments pertaining to the second half of the Ten Commandments, which is everything that has to do with loving other people. And this young ruler responds and says this, and he said, all this I have kept from my youth group. This guy is a member of Lifebox. Look, he's he's in the youth group. This guy could very well be one of us. A guy who's complied and did everything, goes to small group, and Jesus is saying, no, 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 you don't understand. It's not about a checklist. You know the Ten Commandments, right? The first half pertains to the things of God. Do not worship any other gods. Do not make. And the second half is about things that deal with man. And this guy had a, this guy had a, ch- a checklist. I honor God. I honor my father and mother. I don't kill people. I don't commit adultery. I don't steal. It's a checklist. I don't lie. And I don't covet. And Jesus, again, looking at him, doesn't say a word and loves him. See, a lot of times we think of lordship as rules and laws and checklists and things to do, not realizing true lordship is really about love. And Jesus was trying to help this man understand the deception that compliance, religion, doing things, looking good on the outside rather than dealing with the issue of the heart as to who is Lord. Will you do what he says or will you insist on your own way? And here Jesus basically tells this man, you got the checklist right, but you're missing the most important two. Do not worship any, everybody say any, other gods before me. And later we're going to see that this guy could not let go of one of those anys. And by the way, the any might be different for each one of us. It may be a relationship for some of you. It may be a comfort sin. It may be a practice. It may be money. It's all different. Some people more money. Some people less money. The point is do not make any idols. Lordship. Any. Everything. Everything. Jesus is not asking for a partial thing, a partial list. He's saying everything belongs to me. The essence of entering the kingdom of God is the lordship of Jesus, a message that is grossly missing in Christianity today where everything is centered about me and what am I going to get out of this? And down the track, many years later, you find a different result in the lives of people. I remember one time, my wife just got fed up with my, what you would call, this is many years ago, okay? So don't, don't think this was last week. Some of you are thinking, you did that last week. No, I did this about 20 years ago. It was about bullying my wife, you know, because I'm, I'm uh, you know, I can speak. And some of the men, you know this, when your wife says something, you can say it and you can twist it around and she ends up being the one to blame, right? And all the women said, amen. Okay, so... She would complain that, you know, I would do this. And she finally said, I'm going to tell you to Pastor Steve. And I remember sitting in the sofa and my wife is telling Pastor Steve how, you know, Joey bullies me. My wife's wife's the nicest person in the universe. But when you do something wrong to her, she's smart enough to know you shouldn't be doing that. And so she goes to Pastor Steve and tells Pastor Steve, you know, he bullies me every time I tell him that he's late for dinner or or he should be at the time with my children and he comes late. What I would say to bully her, to stop her, get get this, guys. Here's what I'd say, okay? Well, if you would not spend so much money, then I can come early so I don't have to work late. How many of you that's manipulative? (laughs) I'm just telling you the truth, okay? This 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 is how wicked our hearts are without Jesus. And so now she tells Pastor Steve this thing, okay? This is what he would say to me, okay? He would say, if you, okay, if you, if you stop going to the parlor and doing all these things and going to the salon, maybe I can come early. And, and I remember Pastor Steve 
who's normally a nice guy starts looking like, like a man who's really red. Right? Can you imagine an American whose ears... I know when Pastor Steve's angry, his ears turn red. He starts looking at me and saying, Joey, you can't do that. You know, sometimes the Holy Spirit will use a human being, amen? He'll use your wife. He'll use your pastor to come and step in and tell you by the authority of the Word of God, you shouldn't be living that way. Lordship demands that you treat your wife differently. Thank God that somebody with the unction of the Lordship of Jesus Christ spoke into my soul years ago. Don't do that. That's not the way men behave. Men should love their wives. It wasn't overnight. My wife will tell you, I just bullied her last week. No, no. In other words, it's, it, was, it was progressive. But it kept changing. It's choice. Either we receive the Lordship of Jesus or run a checklist in our lives. Again, David Green talks a lot about this idea of Lordship. I don't care if you're in business or out of business. God owns it, says Green. How do I separate it? Well, it's God's in the church and it's mine here. I have purpose in church, but I don't have purpose over here. You can't have a belief system on Sunday and not live it the other six days. Lordship. Why is this man with his billions of dollars not being eaten up by wealth? Because he gets it. Jesus is not Lord here. He's Lord seven days of the week. He's boss. He's not ruler of the things you like and don't like. He is ruler over everything. It's his choice, not mine, not yours. And the effects are different. There are very few members of the Forbes 400 who begin religion to, who bring religion to work. Most notable are Chick-fil-A's Truett Cathy and Forever 21's Jin. So, you know, the owners of, of uh, Forever 21 are born-again Christians who keep Bibles in their offices and print John 3.16 on the bottom of each shopping bag. By the way, this is not a justification for you women to go shopping today. <laughs> but the point is, these are people who live out their Christianity. And these are, it's not really about the wealth. These are people running billions. The guys in Forever 21 are running $6 billion worth of business. It doesn't change them. Because Jesus is Lord. It's clear to them who the boss is. It's clear to them what it's about. And we'll get to more of that later. Here's the point. Back in verse 21, you lack one thing, Jesus said. Okay, I've done all the commandments. I did all the checklists. I did all of this. I, I, I go to church. I volunteer. I, I do all of these things. You lack one thing. Interesting. He says you lack one thing, but he talks about four things. Go, sell, that, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and, when you, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. In other words, what he's saying is you really just lack one thing, which is follow me or make me boss of your life, but that one thing means everything. The one thing which is lordship means everything. And what is specific to this man may not be specific to you, but what is specific to you is still his will, not yours. And the idol may very well be a relationship, that God's saying, give it up, that's not meant for you. It could be a job, it could be money. I was speaking to a gentleman and I, and I was looking at him and telling him, you got all this money and there's other priorities in your life, your marriage and children. Because Jesus is Lord. Deciding that is important. I was looking at my Viber on my phone. You know, you guys don't know what Viber is. We have a Viber group in the family. And my daughter-in-law posted this picture of Batman. This is my grandson, Philip, who's one year old. And he think, I don't think he even knows who Batman is. But it's his father who's trying to make him Batman. I think he's enjoying it. And so the first post was this. And I thought, wow, that's a classic picture. That's the kind of picture that when my grandson grows old, he's going to know he comes from the line of, of uh, Batman. 
But the second picture was even nicer. They put an electric fan in front of him, and now he sees really flying now. I put that up, and I was thinking about this whole idea of the one thing means everything. I think about this kid, and I watch this lovely mother, my, grand, my, 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 my daughter-in-law, and who loves him. It's the one thing she loves. She says, I love this kid. But with that love comes a thousand other things that she doesn't like doing, like cleaning his butt three times a day, like feeding him and messing up his clothes and washing him over and over and over and over again, like waking up in the middle of the night. With love comes a cost. With saying that you are the one thing Jesus comes everything. We make the mistake of saying, Jesus, you are the one I love, but not realizing that when you do that, you're actually giving him everything, lordship. The good news is Jesus will never change. He will uphold you. He will keep you. He will watch over you. He will sustain you. And our job is really just to obey and say, God, you are Lord over my life. Verse 22, disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possession. I need you to understand this. This guy came out with all the life, the excitement, the humility, everything. He said, I, 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 God, I, it would be like any one of us. Come to church, give everything, attend, take notes, do the Bible study, small group, youth group, and then all of a sudden the ending is rather sad. He's disheartened. He's discouraged. And he went away sorrowful. He's sad. Because when Jesus puts his finger on that lordship issue, it changes everything, doesn't it? It causes us to walk away. And I think about moments in my life where I could have walked away and now looking forward as to where I am. It's really, I mean, my marriage and my, my family will not even be anywhere near what it is today if I had chosen to walk away from this idea of lordship. And what stuck him was these great possessions. And again, I reference David Green. Green steadfastly believes that success is not in his doing, not his doing. I think God has blessed us because we have given, he says. Take Green's account of Hobby Lobby's close call with death in 19. In fact, the company almost went bankrupt in 1985. Could have been a moment to get offended with God. On the one hand, there's, a perfect, there's the perfectly reasonable business 101 explanation. He over leveraged the business and diluted the inventory with off brand expensive products like luggage, ceiling pans, and gourmet foods. That's the natural explanation. Green's version was different. It was a pride problem, a lordship problem. Who's boss? And I had to get rid of it because Jesus is boss. He says, describing his leadership style, it's sort of like God says to me, because I was arrogant, I'm going, to let, I have, I'm going to let you have it by yourself. In other words, if you walk away too soon, you might not see the fullness of what I have in store for you. The business 101 answer was downsizing, cost-cutting, and pleading with creditors. The green explanation, getting under his desk to pray for help. Whichever version is right, smart strategy or faith, combined hard work brought back the profits. And today... We know history. Because at the end of the day, lordship is not just about everything. It's about the main thing. Who is boss? Who is lord? Who do you really trust? And who do you really believe for your career? Who will you say yes to? Your heart, your will, your ways, or what Jesus says. As I try and land this, verse 23, And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Three times, repeatedly, in three successive verses, he talks about this idea of entering the kingdom of God. 
The common denominator for every kingdom is one thing, a king, a boss. The entry to the kingdom of God is really to submit yourselves to the authority and the lordship of that king, regardless of how you feel about it. Verse 24, he says, And the disciples were amazed at those words, but Jesus said to them, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom. He repeats himself and makes the point that children are powerless, dependent, inexperienced, incapable of doing anything by themselves, which is really at the end of the day, all of us in this room. Lordship declares, I don't have any ability, I need you. No matter how big Hobby Lobby becomes, Green is adding 35 stores this year, with the long-term goal surpassing 1,000, the founder wants to make sure the company remains faithful long after he's gone. I was thinking about this. This guy's already a billionaire. And he's probably going to make even more billions. And I thought, where does this end? So far, Hobby Lobby has been a traditional family operation. All three of Green's children, Steve and Mart, plus daughter Darcy, are executives, and several of his grandchildren already joined the company. I'm thinking, gosh, these guys are probably really making a lot of money. The ownership has been structured for the company to continue indefinitely. But in the event of sale or dissolution of Hobby Lobby, 90% of the company will go to ministry work while the remaining 10% will be shuttled in a trust reserve for the education and health of family members. I thought, wow, here is a man that understands lordship. Let's put on paper, essentially what he's saying is, if anything happens here, God gets everything, not me. I'm not sure if I can do that just yet. <laughs> but that's what lordship is. And it's amazing that sometimes we think the people who are the richest are the ones that are the most selfish, not if Jesus is Lord. Because if Jesus is Lord, it really doesn't destroy them. My grandkids can't say, I own five and I own ten, and then all of a sudden they're sitting on a yacht. Basically what he's saying is, guys, that's not what this is all about. Says Green, who despite enough wealth for a fleet of Gulf Streams, those are jet planes, still flies economy or coach. Jesus is Lord. And I'm not saying fly coach by any stretch of the word. If you want to fly business class, you do that. That's not the point. The point is, who is Lord over your wealth? Is it you or is it him? Who's the owner? As I try and close this, Mark 10, 25 Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Three times in succession, he makes the point, this is ridiculously impossible unless you make me Lord over your life. But the best part of this story is really the last verse I'm about to share with you. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? And he says, Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible but not with God, for all things are possible with God. If there's a sad note to the story is, had that rich young ruler just had a little bit of lordship and stayed a little longer, he would have heard what Jesus said, that what you thought is impossible is actually possible with me. What you thought is something that can't be done can be done if you will make me Lord over your life. Lordship is an important tenet of Christianity. Jesus is Lord is a foundational biblical truth that we need to embrace if we are to see all that God has in store for each one of us. Amen? Do you stand on your feet as we close in the word of prayer? Just close your eyes. Just soak before the presence of God. The Holy Spirit is here. Father, thank you for this afternoon. Holy Spirit, oh God, I'm asking you to touch every person in this room right now. I'm asking you, God, to reveal yet the truth of Lordship. I'm asking you, Lord, to show each and every one of us areas of our lives, be that relationships, be that practices, be that sins, secret sins, 
comfort sins, com sins that make us comfortable. Lord, whatever it is, Lord, finances, areas of our wealth which have not been put under your Lordship. God, I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, that you bring a conviction, a righteousness and understanding that you are Lord over our lives. And if you're here this afternoon and you sense the Holy Spirit is showing you areas of your life that He wants you to put under the Lordship of Christ. Just gently lift, lift up both your hands towards heaven. Some of you, it's where you spend your time, your energies. Some of you, it's where you spend your private time, things that you do that you shouldn't be doing. Just lift them up right now. Just It's the Holy Spirit. If you're feeling that, that, that you, you're, you're feeling an urge, that's, that's Him. It's just His way of humbling you and bowing down before Him. God, you see our hands raised. And God, I pray that you would just cause this truth and this message to be rooted deep in our hearts. You are Lord. Would you just pray this prayer with me? Jesus Christ, I declare today you're Lord over my life. Your Lord over my finances, your Lord over my affairs, your Lord over my business, my work, your Lord over my time. You are Lord. And God, even as I confess this, I believe, Holy Spirit, that you will strengthen me, strengthen my resolve to make a stand and to trust that you're working things on my behalf. This is my prayer in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, Amen and Amen.